Can you see the screen, Victor? Yes? Yes. Okay. So, and now in this session, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about direct database interaction. So, well, first of all, the SDK has almost all the accessing that you want to access. Uh, so to all the data that you want to really access, you have a repository for that. But in the case that you need some other needs for your application, some, I uh, know you want to create a new queries for that, uh, the SDK also allows you to directly interact with the database. So yeah, for that reason, uh, the SDK is exposing a database adapter uh, and which is that I said that you're gonna be able to uh, query to the direct, to the database directly. Also, uh, all the models uh, in the SDK uh, include a method uh, with the name create. And if you pass to this create method a cursor, uh, it will automatically generate the the object from the model. Uh, also. Uh, the database uh, has um, uh, the, the, the table uh, model, so you are gonna be able to check it too. Here, uh, I have the database schema. So if I come here, you can see, well, I think you can see it more or less, all of the, um, tables that there are stored in our the SDK. If we uh, go near to one of the tables, you can see that, uh, the, for example, this is the attribute table and you have the code, you have the name, display name, all these possible columns in the table. And well, it's just huge. Like you have a lot of information stored in your small device. So to, to see what, what is the difference? Uh, the DHS2 has uh, 452 tables in 2.32. Now I, I will say that they have more, near 500. And the Android SDK has now 110 tables with a lot of providers, which is like a lot of information that you can use to show all the information to your uh, clients, to your users. So here uh, you can see an example of a table info. So in case that you want to know a bit about the structure, you can find in every class uh, some information. This one is the period table info, but you have uh, for each table an object like that. So you will have the program table info, the data set table info, the attributes table info. So in this case, uh, for the table, the period table info, you can uh, find the name of the table. You can find some of the columns here. You have that the period have the end date, the start date, the period type and the period ID. That's just an example. So you can find all this information in the SDK too. In case that you want to interact with the database, uh, you, you can access through this uh, module. So, well, it's not a module, it's just the database adapter. So you write the two database adapter and then you can execute all these methods here. For example, if you want to delete a table or you want to delete a, with a clause or you want to query some information you want to execute or set a transaction, et cetera. So you have here all the methods that uh, this database adapter allows you. And here is a bit of a comparison of what you can do uh, using the SDK repositories and modules and what you should do if you are using um, the database adapter. So here in the very first example, 
we have the program module and we access to the programs. And here we are filtering by program type uh, using the program type with registration. And then we just call the get method. So that will return all the programs with this program type. If we want to do the same uh, with a, a direct query, uh, you can query, uh, so go to the database adap uh, adapter and then query. Here you have the, the query and then you pass the, you, you pass the with registration string. So what uh, this query method is gonna uh, make is he will, put a word, this is this symbol, this symbol, the name of the string that you're putting here. So after that, you're gonna get the cursor. And then you, if you check that the cursor is uh, not null, uh, you can move to the, the first row. And then with the method uh, that is in the object program, the create method, you can pass the cursor and you will retrieve a program. So it's a more a bit longer, but it's not that complicated uh, because the SDK provides the create cursor. Without this method, it, it will be very, very confusing. So just try to use always this create method. And also do not forget to close the cursor, please. Always close the cursor because if you don't do that, and uh, your memory will run out and it will, uh, so your application will break. Here you have another uh, query, a bit more complicated. Uh, here we are using the event module to get an event. Uh, and then we try to uh, use the enrollment UID uh, to filter the events. And then inside the equals of the enrollment UID query, we are uh, put, uh, searching for an enrollment which has this T UID and is this program. So at the end, you're gonna have the events for this enrollment, for this TI, for this program. So that you can do it in this block here if you're using the repositories, but you also can use uh, a cursor query. But um, it's a bit dangerous because uh, if you see the query here, just this select event from event, join enrollment on da, 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 da. You see that there is a lot of information here and you could uh, commit some mistakes uh, when taping and just one small character here will end in up the uh, win with a, with a fail. So for that reason, we really recommend to use the repositories if you can do it. But well, you are free to use the database adapter uh, if, if you need it. In this sample, you are gonna have to go to the cursor and then move to the first, uh, loop the cursor, and in each uh, loop, just create the, the event using the create method. Uh, so yeah, uh, everything that uh, we are talking in this academy is in, the, in this documentation, in the page docs, .org. And for the direct interaction with the database, uh, you can follow this link here. I would like to, sorry. Uh, I would like just to remember that this, uh, this class here, we create a, a, a method in all the objects. It's like really, really useful if you are gonna use in the module. And that's it for this session. We are not gonna uh, make any, any exercises. So now uh, let's talk about the DHS2 compatibility. Uh, this is something that we mentioned in the first day and uh, that uh, the, the SDK is compatible with, a, with at least 
the, late, the, the latest <coughs> three versions of this S2. <coughs> so, um, so it means that you can use the SDK and you don't have to care about the version of the server. And probably you don't even know the version of the server when you are uh, uh, developing the application. <clears throat> so it is the SDK who who deals with the uh, with any modification in the in the web API, like a new parameter or uh, uh, some changes in the endpoints or whatever. So the the product of the SDK is to uh, encapsulate uh, the logic as much uh, the changes, sorry, as much as possible uh, by sending the data models usually. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes the changes in the server are uh, are very big, and it is not enough to the, the SDK cannot encapsulate the, those changes, and it, ha, it the SDK has to tell the application that there is some changes that has to be done. Um, it is yeah. The good thing here is that. It is the SDK responsible to notify those changes, so you don't have to care about unexpected and unexpected changes that you didn't notice in the web API. It is the SDK who has to deal with that. And of course, the changes in the SDK uh, will be properly doc documented in the upgrade notes. So, in case we have any change in the SDK that is a breaking change, we will properly document that thing. So just for you to know um, a kind, what kind of changes uh, um, what we had had so far in the SDK in this year and a half. So an example of uh, an, a small change, uh, a change that can be encapsulated uh, by the SDK, it was the change between versions to 29 and 230 uh, in the program object. In the program object in 229, we have the capture coordinates property that was a boolean, true or false. <clears throat> and, um, and coordinates were a point, always a point. And in 230, this property was removed and replaced by feature type. And now the feature type can be a point, a polygon, a multipolygon, or none. Um, so in the SDK, we adopt the new feature type and also keep the the previous capture coordinates. And we can do kind of a mapping here. So we can map between false and none, and then between true in capture coordinates to point in the feature type. So in this way, we don't force the the applications to update to the new feature type. We just mark the, the capture coordinates with the, with the deprecated annotation. So it means that this property is, uh, is going to be removed eventually, and uh, maybe in the next version or, or in a major version. And that it means that you should use the feature type property, even if you are working with a 213, uh, 229 server, you can use the feature type property and the SDK will do the translation. So this is an example of, of a small change. Uh, an example of a breaking change uh, was the change in the relationship model in 230. Uh, in 229 or up to 229, uh, the relationship were between a TI and a TI always. Now in 2.30, the model changed and you can have a relationship between TI enrollments and events and TI enrollments and events. So the model is completely different. Um, the approach here was, well, let's suppose we have an application 1.0 that uh, is using, that is, it's compatible with 228, 229. Okay. Then 230 appears, and yeah, and the model 
has changed. So, in order to create a new version, uh, 1.1, that would be compatible with all of them, with, with 230, 229, and 228. In this, in this transition, uh, the app will be forced to do some changes in the code. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the application in 1.1 will use the 230 model, I mean, the new model that is more complex. Um, so using that model, the SDK can translate to 230 and then to 229 and 228. So you can use uh, the same model with all the three versions. But it's important here that the change in this case uh, implies a change, some changes in the app. Okay, and this uh, and this is very related to the strategy to manage uh, upgrades in the server. So let's suppose uh, I mean you want to you are you have an application on one point zero and you are using two thirty two uh, uh, server. So what will be the approach to upgrade? The, the server in case you want to upgrade the server because you want to upgrade to 233. Uh, in case the process will be in first place, upgrade uh, all the applications in the field because uh, you know that upgrading the applications all of all the end users can take some time. Uh, even if uh, the connection is not very good Maybe it can take some weeks, for example, to up, to update all the devices in the field. If the project is very large, yeah, it can take a few weeks, and it's and it's normal. So in first place, you can you can update the applications. It does not it doesn't matter if there are some users that are using the 1.0 app, other users that are have already updated their application and are using 1.1. You are still in 232, so uh, all the users can still work because the uh, 1.1 is compatible with 232. And only once uh, all the users, all the users in the field uh, have updated their applications, then you can move to the 233 server. And just the application will continue working because 1.1 is compatible with 233. So there will be no interruption in the work. So and this is the way in uh, this is the way that uh, the compatibility this compatibility strategy can help in the server upgrade. Okay, any question about this? This is just a small theoretical session for you to know how it works. So now uh, let's talk about the the roadmap uh, for for the uh, for the next version. Now we are in 1.4, and we have seen that in 1.4 we had um, basic analytic features. Um, now, uh, yeah, for the next version for 1.5, we want to extend this functionality because now we only have a uh, basic analytics about even line list analytics analytics in the context of a ti mainly uh prime indicators that are evaluated in the context of an event or a ti now we want to have prime indicators evaluated across all the ti's or even indicators for aggregated evaluated in in a wider context so this is one of the things that are coming. Uh, also, we want to extend the utility or logic method. Um, we have talked about the event service, the enrollment service, some helpers that are there already. But there are a lot of things 
that have to do with the uh, with the DSA two logic that that we yeah the SDK should care about that. Um, so more helpers, uh, ping services to identify if the server is uh, connected or not in a more reactive way. Also validation of the data entry. We are working on that to validate if the, the value provided for that specific value type is is correct or not. Um, more about tracker. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this functionality, the break the glass. Uh, the break the glass, this thing that is, yeah, is uh, it's a, an amazing thing, thing because it, it allows you to hide some TIs depending on the context and the or unit and the access level of the program. But it's also, it introduced some complexity when dealing with uh, permissions. So this is not implemented in the SDK yet. Uh, so basically, TIs that are behind the glass uh, are hidden. We cannot see those TIs. So this is something that is coming in the next version, 1.5. And also, it involves uh, all the flow to get the explicit consent to download the TI. I mean, a reason why you want to access that particular TI. And also, the consent to upload the TIs. That's something that is coming. Um, another uh, topic that was mentioned, like, well, almost from the beginning of the SDK, is uh, the possibility to have support for more than one user. Because now, uh, when, when you are using the application and you log in with a, a particular user, and then you log out, and you and then and you oh sorry and uh, you log in again with a different user or a different server. The previous one is deleted, so because the SDK only supports one user at the same time. So this is something that we want to introduce: the ability, the capability to have more than one user or the same user connected to more than one server. That this is a common use case when you have a, an instance for aggregated and another instance for tracking. Also, uh, yeah, we want to explore the widget thing. I mean, there are a lot of things that are, that probably any Android application will have to implement at some point. Like for example, the organization unit D the registration unit three is probably any application will have to do that. So it's a very common thing. Or the rendering of the value types, for example, if, uh, for the date or for uh, for the file. I don't know. There is a lot of yeah, a lot of things that can be shared between application in the form of widgets or UI components. Uh, yeah, this is something that is in the roadmap as well. Um, yeah, uh, and also we want to introduce some improvements in the synchronization process. And when it comes to metadata, uh, we have seen that there is just a single method to trigger the download of the metadata, and it downloads all the metadata that is relevant to the user. But maybe even if the user has access to all that metadata, uh, for a particular use case, you only want to download, I don't know, a particular program and uh, you know in advance, or I don't know, you have parametrized somehow this program in the server, I don't know. Or you want to be more selective in the download. Uh, and even think about this online offline thing but may because maybe um, we mainly work with the data that is on, in the database of the device in, in offline mode uh, we have a repository that combines online and offline that is the track identity instance search you can search both 
online and offline. Um, yeah, we have this thought about extending this this feature to all the repositories, and maybe you don't want to store track identity instance in your device. You you because you are sure you have a very good connectivity. You are in a hospital and there is Wi-Fi in all the hospitals, so you can work online always. So maybe this is an option, or you want to to update the program uh, every time you access the program and keep a, a local copy just in case you, you lose the connection. I don't know, it's something to explore. Um, and that's all. Uh, well, a last thing I just want to mention is about the uh, Kotlin, the Kotlin thing, because uh, the SDK is mainly written in Java, but now we are moving to Kotlin. Uh, all this academy has been in, uh, written in Java, but Probably, I don't know, we could be moving to Kotlin at some point. Um, yeah, that's all for the roadmap. Uh, any question or any comment on any suggestion of new features? We will really like to, to know our new features, new requests, something you, uh, that you missed in the SDK. Anyway, if you have any comments or any requests for new features, you can use the Slack channel as well. But it would be nice to to know you have more ideas about things that you can we can add to.